So I, I love very dearly Aquilegia canadensis, of course, the Eastern Columbine. It is, it's so pretty and cheerful, but it also just has a really beautiful story of the way that different species shape each other. And I love to think about that. I love to think about pollination ecology, especially, and to think about flowers as the manifested desires of their pollinator partners. And with Eastern Columbine, we're literally looking at the deepest desire of ruby-throated hummingbirds. And that to me is just this like magical jewel of a flower. Um, Aquilegia canadensis is red because birds have a fourth photoreceptor that allows them to see red incredibly well, whereas with bees, they have a hard time differentiating between red and green. So when we see red flowers in North America, we know that those flowers evolved alongside of hummingbirds and that they bloom for them in order to get pollinated, of course, and that the flowers are trading the, their own nectar um, to the hummingbirds, and that nectar has amino acids and viscosity that is tailored specifically for the hummingbirds. And we, we've all seen hummingbirds in our gardens visit many, many flowers, but <clears throat> for, the, for the Eastern Columbine and other red tubular flowers, those flowers have been literally designed by hummingbirds over thousands and thousands of years, the nectar composition and the shape of the flower, everything about them. And so in Eastern North America and the Northeast in New York, Columbine blooms in spring, right before the ruby-throated hummingbird returns from overwintering in Mexico and Central America. And I just find that so cheerful and beautiful, especially considering that there are so many other red flowers along their journey that bloom for them as they fly through. And you get this sort of red wave of flowers that moves from the south to the northeast as the birds fly through. And yeah, it's hard to imagine anything lovelier. So that's a, a definitely a vivid vote for the Columbine, <laughs> for the OK, and for hummingbirds in behalf of hummingbirds. Benjamin, what about you? Let's just go with Carex albicans, white tinge sedge. Sedge is one of the uh, common names for it. And I mean, because you sort of start out, uh, you know, everybody, everybody has room in their garden for a, a ground cover matrix plant, the filler like a sedge or a grass. Um, even if you have established beds right now, you always have room to jam in plants underneath. And that's where these, we were talking before about soft landings, um, you know, where, where we can get these sedges and grasses poked in anywhere and just increase ecosystem services many times over. So Carex, uh, this Carex. particular Carex, yeah. I care about Carex, Margaret. <laughs> Um, for uh, for people who haven't seen it, I guess it was was it last year or the year before when Mount Cuba Center, the Native Plant Center in Delaware, um, published its uh, report comparing different carex species that they had trialed in their trial area over three or four year period, and um, it was pretty interesting. And of course, it's mid Atlantic specific, but you could extrapolate in some cases. And they're actually growing them on; they left them in place so that they can do mowing tests. They're, they're like mowing and seeing which ones can get trampled and mowed. And so they're like putting them to these tests beyond the initial test, which I think is really interesting too, because isn't that what we're looking for in certain situations, mm -hmm. um, these other use, uses and so forth. So one vote for Aquilegia, one vote for Carex. Is your vote still for Oaks, uh, Doug? <laughs> it would have to be, uh, but I don't, you know, I talk about Oaks. I don't want to imply that they're the only good plant. No. I am, you know, I'm an entomologist. So I look at plants that make insects because insects are the little things that run the world. So the more we have, the better off we're going to be. And oaks are the best at doing that. But but native cherries are really good. Native willows are really good. Hickories and birches. We've got a number of very good insect makers out there. The keystone plants. The keystone plants, exactly.